to skeptics. Um, and that's that's pretty painful. It is the, the flip side of the fact that so many thousands of people at this point have made their career and their um, their drive and their goal promoting this new form of learning. And, and yeah, it's really demoralizing. Um, all it takes sometimes in a faculty context is the one person at the meeting who has the ax to grind about this online learning thing. Those students aren't really doing anything. And it really shuts down a lot of debate. So, you know, as far as that sort of political component of it, I don't think any of us have, have the answer. But I think first off, it is really important to, um, to take in the more reasoned criticism and, and actually address it. Um, I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we do accidentally give the impression that all technology is good, all the kids you know, are, are screaming for technology in their education and, and other kind of overgeneralizations over that we might make. So I think that's kind of our, our first line, line of defense is not to, um, as enthusiastic as we are, um, not to let that completely uh, dominate the message and then come across as, as Pollyanna or, or unrealistic. Um, I think breaking it down bit by bit. Uh, so if, for example, the objection is, well, this is just going to cut teachers out so they can you know, mass produce courses, you know, they being administration often is, is people's concern, um, and just sell those and faculty won't, won't have a place anymore. Uh, I think it helps to actually look at successful programs and how it's actually played out. And now that online learning has been around for a little while, we have a better ability to do this. Um, so that's, that's one part of the, the equation. Uh, I think the finances is, is always um, a very fraught part of this as well. I think here's where an administration will say, we're going to save a ton of money by putting it all online. And those of us in the know are going, no, no, you're going to spend a lot of money doing this. It's very beneficial, but it's, it's certainly no um, huge cost-saving measures. So there's where you know, simple facts and making sure you're talking about the same set of facts. Uh, can be can be very helpful. Uh, I think I think to really res when we're talking faculty to faculty, I think uh, having the discipline as a starting point is always a good way to um, open a dialogue with faculty. So uh, respecting that every discipline is different, that the teaching concerns are very very different and that the faculty are always the disciplinary experts, um, that, that's absolutely crucial. And I think uh, having it be an opportunity for creativity can transmit some of the, some of the things that brought us into, um, into the field in the first place. So uh, for example, let's say I'm sitting with a, uh, with a history professor and they're not so sure about this online thing, you know, don't start there. Say, well, what is it? about the discipline of history that your students don't understand? And what is it that you most wish that they did understand by the end of your course? What do people not get about it? Uh, and then everything just breaks wide open. All kinds of ideas will tumble out. Uh, and that's where you can then funnel that into, well, you know, how, what are some ways that we can do that? And also that student accountability piece that I mentioned earlier. Uh, when technology isn't presented as a shortcut or you got to do this, um, but rather as a way to make students more accountable and more engaged and more responsible for themselves, that's also um, something that's very, very appealing. I think just by enabling professors to kind of know what's out there and not really to enforce anything by mandate, but rather say, hey, here are four or five different ways that we can make your life easier, make your message more effective, make your class more engaging, then I think as long as it's from it's kind of given from a support standpoint rather than a you know executive mandate, I think um, it's a much better way to uh, win hearts and minds and hopefully improve the uh, the general classroom for everyone involved. Approaching it from kind of a we're both learning this together kind of approach, where if it's something you're interested in, it's something I'm interested in because we have we have their needs at heart. So I think doing a little bit of research, coming back to them, maybe setting up kind of a weekly scheduled um, meetup. I think teachers really appreciate that one-on-one -on -one or the face-to-face -face time that you can give them. Of course, everyone's very busy, but when you do make an effort to say, hey, you know, I'm just checking in, wanted to see if you have time this week to touch base on your project. Um, 
I read some really interesting articles this week, and I think um, we could have a lot to talk about. Let me know whenever you're available. Um, sometimes that's all it takes to get the faculty members kind of foot in the door and to get them interested in, in, in to participating in your program. I think one of the things that we do to massage some of faculty concerns about what really could be viewed as intrusive observation within their online course is to really position it to say, we're creating this safety net so that you don't fall. The thing we need you to do is we need you to be the best instructor you can be. I don't want you to be the IT help desk. I don't want you to troubleshoot every single student's technical problem. That's why we're here. We're here to cover your back. We're not here to try to tell you how to teach your course. That's your domain. Our job is to shepherd you through this experience in a way that becomes positive for you. And again, creating that sense of trust, the fact that we're there to help. We are not there in any threatening way. Uh, that, that's the message that we share. And again, I think it proves itself out over time because we do know faculty talk to other faculty. So the word of mouth can spread and the good news is spread and faculty have buy-in. When we're talking about more evidence-based teaching or teaching in new ways, it's not, oh, you know, your students aren't achieving enough, so you need to go in and work harder and do more. No, usually the students need to be doing more. Student effort is the basis, um, just about the only basis for student success, full stop. Uh, now, as faculty, we don't just get to sit back and complain about it. Our job is to elicit that effort. And I think when you can shift faculty into that mindset, that's motivating. You're not asking for more. You're sometimes asking for different. And I know in my own development as a teacher, most of the time when I needed to do something differently, I needed to take my hands off. I needed to, for example, not say, well, here's the online tool I want you to use to mock up your apps. I needed to say, well, those things change all the time and they can use Google as well as I can, so you go find it, right? Um, instead of, here's the study guide that I've worked out every single, all these examples and so forth, maybe students can take on a good chunk of that. Now again, it doesn't take me, the teacher, out of the picture. I'm the one that has the wisdom, the discernment, the disciplinary expertise to know what's productive and to know how to tell you know, the good from the bad in terms of content. So that's, I think, the kind of mindset shift where faculty really start to light up and they start to engage when you put it in those terms instead of, well, this new thing is here and now you've got to pick up the slack and do it. Working with faculty who've been teaching online for a very long time is probably the biggest challenge, uh, simply because I think there's a feeling that, well, I've got this down, I've got this nailed, and I know what I'm doing. But at a baseline level, we realize that the world keeps turning and by and large, new knowledge is added to any specific domain. New teaching approaches emerge. New learning theories emerge. So revisiting things can be as simple as saying, by the way, there's a new tool available in the learning management system that really might solve that part of your course you haven't been happy with. Or rethinking and saying, you know, gee, did you know that there's actually all these great online resources now that are freely available to students? Maybe we could freshen up some of those uh, articles you've been using since 1995. Now, of course, we have to approach that in a more tactful way than I just said. But, but the notion is to really encourage faculty to think of this not as a static snapshot in time, but something that continues to evolve and grow. I think faculty who have been teaching online can really benefit from a program that, again, addresses those things that, that have changed because it, no, no field, especially one that is still as relatively as young as online learning is, is, is stagnant. Uh, it's, it, even established disciplines like history, uh, it's we constantly have new perspectives and new evidence is coming you know, to light all, all the time. And, and in a relatively young area like online learning, I think we, we are still learning so much about what works and what doesn't and you know, it, how to use new things, the learning management systems, get new tools. 
and new functions in them. So obviously there, there needs to be some how-to sessions that faculty get. But there's also a lot of sharing that needs to go on, I think, because if you're just doing the button pushing, they're, they're not gonna come to that. It's the, they're not gonna pay attention to it. But if you can have their peers that are also teaching come in and say, I did this, I tried this, and it was great. You know, it, it changed my class. You know, it's, I, I was getting sick of this and now I love it again. And I think those experiences, those sorts of things are, are really powerful uh, for, for long time faculty. Sometimes we like to joke that depending on who you're teaching, it can sometimes feel like you're literally teaching, you know, old dogs new tricks in a sense. And that some people who, you know, maybe have been doing this for all their life are very set in their ways. So again, that's why I mean kind of approaching it as we're here to help you rather than we're here to tell you what to do. Um, definitely kind of builds a little bit of, of trust. A lot of the faculty professional development sessions that we involved, that we're involved giving, um, have a lot of give and take. So it's not necessarily us getting up there. We, you know, don't want to look like hypocrites where we are in front of the lecture now and telling them what to do. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, we try to foster a lot of communities of practice within our university. We um, encourage discussion forum posts through each of the training sessions that we do, both to encourage people to get comfortable using the tools, but also, I mean, if you're in a room full of academics who have a collective couple hundred years of teaching under their belt, why wouldn't you want to solicit those people for feedback and, and to share best practices against one another? I, I think in addition to just the idea of faculty testimonials, it, it's also the, it's, I know Dean knows this stuff and I know Dean knows what he's doing, you know, it's, but this is my class. And, and there, there's still, there is still that separation, no matter how much respect you get as an instructional designer or as uh, you know, a system administrator for knowing what you're talking about, there, there's always going to be that little bit of a faculty member's mindset that's going to respond a little bit better to another full-time faculty member. So I, I think that's one of the important reasons why we want to, it's whenever possible, involve other faculty in what we do. Even if they introduce it, and then, you know, it's then the instructional designer or the instructional technologist steps in and says, okay, so now if you want to do what Vencat is doing with online office hours, let's walk through and actually set that up in your course. And they take over the how-to portion of that, but the faculty member sets up the, why do you really want to do this sort of thing as the, you know, it, this isn't just coming out of theory, this isn't just a new tool, this is actually something that can help you in your course. One of the things we've really succeeded in creating at Oswego is a culture of respect and a, and a culture of mutual trust, you know, and understanding that you're the expert in your domain, we're here to facilitate and make you the best you can possibly be as an online instructor. So establishing those relationships understanding the dependencies between what an instructor does, how we support them, and frankly, being able to create some clear boundaries so that there's a sense of safety from the instructor's part, I think is something we've created as a culture and we've sustained over time. There's kind of our usual suspects lineup of teachers who are always looking to try new things. Um, I'm, as I gotta say, in my job, I'm very appreciative of having kind of our, our old standbys who are always willing to take risks and are not afraid to, you know, do things that may be exciting but dangerous or, or risky or untested. And so I think um, they kind of fall within a subset of academic practitioners who are just very open-minded. I think that's probably the one of the, the greatest features you can have being a, a, a professor nowadays is just not being afraid to try new things. It's, it's something that we ask of our students every day so I think it's important that we follow those same pieces of advice.